Hello and good afternoon. I'm Katherine Heflin, a second year master's student at the Harvard School of Public Health in the Health Policy and Management Department and a Carson Family Fellow. It is an immense privilege to introduce the 21st Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. I had the pleasure of first meeting then Kansas Governor Sebelius when she gave my middle school graduation address at the Topeka Collegiate School and again during her final days as Secretary of Health and Human Services while I was an intern there. Coming as no surprise to us here at the Harvard School of Public Health, Ms. Sebelius is one of America's foremost experts on health policy, health care reform, human service delivery, and executive leadership. She helped to lead the President's charge to pass and implement the most significant health reform in half a century. In addition to her work on the Affordable Care Act, she has led numerous ambitious efforts to provide all Americans with the opportunity to live happier, healthier, and more successful lives. Her national and international leadership has spanned across early childhood initiatives, women's health, tobacco control, HIV AIDS, and prevention of chronic diseases. As Secretary of Health and Human Services, she oversaw a trillion dollar budget, a staff of nearly 90,000, and dozens of agencies and offices. And she was in charge of the nation's public health response to national disasters and emerging epidemics, including the 2010 Haiti earthquake and the H1N1 flu outbreak. The reforms Ms. Sebelius introduced to our nation's health delivery system are improving the quality of care patients receive while driving down costs. Her work to eliminate health disparities has touched millions of Americans' lives. Before I turn the session over to Dr. Tim Johnson, who will be moderating today, please welcome Ms. Sp Kathleen Sebelius to the Harvard School of Public Health and the Voices in Leadership series. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. <laughs> Madam Secretary, allow me to begin by personally saying how much I've admired your work uh, from a distance um, as the elected insurance commissioner in Kansas, two-term governor, secretary of HHS. Um, you have said very publicly and openly that the uh, period of the rollout of the Affordable Care Act was the most difficult period in your professional life. So now looking back a year uh, later at that whole episode, indicate the two or three mistakes that were made that in retrospect were clearly mistakes, but also tell us the positive things that happened to allow the rollout to be successful two months later on December 1st. Well, first of all, it's, it's great to be here. Great to be at Harvard. Great to be with future health leaders of this country. We need you. Hurry up. Study hard. <laughs> learn all you can. And get ready. Um, and I, I have to give a special shout out to uh, Howard Coe, who has taken a really important position here at Harvard in health leadership as uh, a school organizer. But Howard was my assistant secretary of health. We worked very closely on a lot of the issues that Catherine just talked about. So I want to thank him. Not only for being here today, but for that incredible service. Um, the rollout was awful, and um, clearly we could have used more testing. That would have helped. Um, we could have uh, used more time um, to actually get all the technology pieces, and it would have been helpful to have more accurate information. Um, we were told as recently as a week out by all of the contractors responsible and by the CMS folks that we were ready to go, that it wouldn't be perfect, uh, but uh, that it was ready. And clearly, <laughs> that was a long way from reality. So, um, And the uh, reason that testing wasn't done was you felt an obligation to meet that October 1st deadline no matter what, almost. Well, the, the law said that I, as secretary, was to design an open enrollment period. We knew that benefits by law were to start on January 1st, and so we needed to have uh, people be able to enroll or get a look at the products before January 1st, and so we picked a date about two <laughs> years out and drove toward that date. Um, and I don't know, frankly, Tim, if, if we had said, you know, December 1st, if those two, I mean, if that would have just mm. slipped also. But whatever it was, uh, it was pretty awful in terms of just a non-functioning system, having promised the ease of, you know, buying an airline ticket mm. from Travelocity. It was like buying an airline ticket through a fax machine. Um, mm. You know, nobody could get in. You saw spinning wheels. Um, 
at the end of the day, as you say, um, did a couple of things. I mean, first of all, we had to own it, apologize for it, fix it, and then hopefully move on. So the analysis was done very carefully with lots of new eyes and ears, lots of kicking the tires, saying, we think in eight weeks we can have this functioning. And that was a very scary bet to make <laughs> because there weren't going to be two bites at this apple. You know, if it had crashed again, it would have been probably game over. Um, but there was enough confidence in this new group of tech folks and some of the existing folks that they really could meet those deadlines. So it was a 24-7 full-time operation. Um, and then the goal really was to get enough people to enroll by the end of open enrollment that you actually had a balanced risk pool and a market that worked. And that became you know, rather than having six months to do that, we had four months to do that. Uh, but at the end of the day, that piece of the puzzle with lots of help and support with the president using his bully pulpit for outreach, lots of, you know, everybody from NBA players to rock stars uh, to faith leaders and health leaders, mayors, others uh, really did this amazing outreach. So. Rather than having the target of 7 million, we had almost 8 million mm. people sign up uh, by April 15th. And during that period from October 1st to December 1st, the second bite of the apple, as you say, were you able to do some actual testing then for sure? Or were you rolling out on faith on December 1st? Well, it was a little bit on faith again, because although we were letting, um, you know, there were enough people, actually that sort of beta testing, if. Um, uh, your students are familiar with the tech world. A lot of the um, commercial products are rolled out through beta testing. So they pick a certain group of people and kind of run them through. Well, when you have a law that is in place for everybody at the same time, the notion that I, as Health and Human Services Secretary, could say, okay, people in Massachusetts can enroll, but nobody else. We're going to beta test Massachusetts. Um, the outcry would have been enormous. That was not a politically viable option. What happened, though, during those eight weeks is people were still using the site, a limited number. And so we were able to beta test with people using a, and identify at every point along the way where the problems were and what was going on. So now it's a year later, and we are in the middle of the Ebola saga. I refuse to use the word crisis in the US. It certainly is a crisis in Africa. Uh, since you're no longer uh, the manager on the field, you're sitting in the luxury box now looking down. <laughs> what do you think about what's happening with the way the Ebola crisis has been handled by the White House, um, by Tony Fauci's office, and the CDC? There seems to be some lack of coordination there. Well, I think that it's always difficult to predict what's coming over the transom next. And I, I would imagine if you had asked public health officials, political officials six months ago, list the top 10 things to worry about, no one would have put Ebola on the list of issues. Um, I'm a huge fan of Tom Frieden, head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I think he is one of the best public health experts, not only in this country, but in the world. Uh, does that mean everything was perfect? I think he tried to give a sense of confidence, and, and in hindsight, it looked overly smug, saying, you know, we will stop Ebola in its tracks in the United States when there was a breach at a hospital. Um, was every hospital prepared to deal with Ebola? Clearly not. Um, I can tell you, you know, my own state of Kansas, I can't imagine if somebody had come in the door, which hospital would have been ready to quiz a patient adequately enough to even identify where he or she had traveled. Most people don't even take social history. So there have been some steps. I can tell you today, hospitals are better prepared than they were a week ago. Uh, I think every hospital in the country now has identified where their protective gear is, uh, has a protocol of how to put it on and off that probably didn't happen before. And, you know, is there 
a need to coordinate among agencies. It's something this president has believed in very strongly and goes across the board. But I think the difference maybe in having a person is somebody is waking up now every morning and that's all they're thinking about. They're not Tony Fauci thinking of a range of vaccines and possibility. They're not Tom Frieden thinking about all the CDC issues, uh, but they're only thinking of what are the pieces of the puzzle for Are this. you concerned that the new czar is not a medical person? No. Um, we have the expertise, I think, in the right places as the medical. This is really more a logistical manager. You know, what does Department of Homeland Security, what role do they play? Because they are in charge of airport screenings and warnings. You know, what role does the Defense Department, who now is going to put additional folks on the ground, what, what CDC's role both in effort? I mean, so thinking about um, the logistics of how to coordinate, how to communicate, who makes the decision when, I, I think is um, doesn't need to be a medical provider. You talked about Tom Frieden maybe being overly confident in some of his public statements. I have been forever intrigued as someone in the media by the certainty with which politicians and public officials are often forced to speak, maybe against their better private judgment. <laughs> uh, talk about that tension when you in a public role are trying to reassure the public and therefore wanting to use very strong, confident language, but knowing inside that there are real questions. How do you walk that tightrope? Well, I'll, I'll put it back into my own world please, please. Um, because certainly I was hauled before Congress 15 times in the lead up to October 1st, 2013, and asked with very specific uh, information, are you ready to go? Will you be ready to go? Is this site ready? And at each point, I said, absolutely. Um, I was not lying to anyone. I wasn't um, trying to mislead anyone. I, I was basing it on the best information I had and also a sense of confidence that we would be ready. So, you know, when the um, flaws happened and the botch rollout became very public, then I was hauled back up saying, well, you lied to us and you didn't tell us the truth. And um, so I think it's a bit of a catch-22. I think Dr. Frieden did what um, he should have done, probably, and was urged to do, which is confidence that the American health system had the equipment, had the isolation, had the training, had the ability to actually deal with Ebola in a very different way than Africa, which is really what he was commenting on. Um, what was going on with the number of deaths in Africa had a lot to do with the infrastructure in Africa, which was not at all well equipped to deal with isolating people, training people, getting protective equipment. So he was giving a great deal of certainty and confidence. And in hindsight, then it looks like, well, you were, you know, you were wrong. There was a problem. Um, so I think it's, I, I think you want the American people to have confidence that things are going to be okay. If if he had said from the outset, well, we're really not sure. You know, we we think we know about Ebola, but maybe people will die here in this country. Or you know, we we hope that it's going to be okay, but it depends on where you live, or it depends on which hospital you go to. I think the panic that would have emitted from that kind of uncertainty would have been palpable and probably very dangerous. So you're in a catch-22. I've often wondered why in that situation public officials can't say something like, we can never be 100% sure about everything, but this is what and probably a little, that would a little prologue. That nuance would probably be very good. And then they, I, I can guarantee you since I've been in these situations, yeah. well, what aren't you sure about? Yeah. Well, what exactly will go wrong? Yeah. Well, what part of it, if you're not 100%, are you 90%, yes. are you 83%, are there going to be 17% of the people who die? I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, so unfortunately, we live in an era where every word that comes out of your mouth is then taken as, you know, you must validate that. What does that mean? What do you have in mind? Well, if you're not 100% sure, then are you sure at all? Well, why aren't you sure? Um, so it's, it's hard to have a nuanced conversation. How has your understanding <laughs> of this very difficult arena changed during your years as insurance commissioner, then governor of a state, and then in the very visible national position. Did you have an evolving understanding of how your role as a communicator had to change? 
Well, I'll, um, yes. And I would say it, it happened at three different stages. I grew up in a political family. My father ran for office when I was five for the first time. I thought that's what families did in the fall. They went door to door and put up yard signs. <laughs> no one told me it was a voluntary activity. Um, he, I would say, was less than discreet about his public comments and got tagged for it a number of times. Um, headlines, they, they became ads in campaigns. So I, I learned as a child, he was very funny and often very um, brutally honest, but it was the kind of thing that you probably shouldn't say out loud. Um, but he did. And so I, I watched that experience and learned from that 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 probably, um, while you might share some things with friends, you don't necessarily want it on the front page of the New York Times. I learned um, along the way from media consultants uh, about ways to phrase things in a less, uh, you know, not changing my opinion, not changing my beliefs, but at least putting it in language that people could grasp and understand, and in even doing symbolic things. I, I was the governor of Kansas. Kansas is a big cowboy state, a big gun state. I do not believe in conceal and carry laws. Uh, we did not have one in the state of Kansas. I vetoed that law three or four times as it passed the legislature. Um, but they had me do things like, I vetoed the law in camouflage one year as I was going out to lead the effort for the governor's one-shot turkey shoot because I could shoot a shotgun and I actually could kill a turkey. And that, that became a way to say, I like hunting, I believe in guns in the proper way, but I don't think conceal and carry. So in the office of secretary, um, I had a boss again. And it had been a long time since I'd had a boss. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, I say that because that was a real learning experience because there were times where I wanted to say things a certain way or do things a certain way and I was reminded that there was actually somebody I worked for who was down the street who may have a different view um, and may, I was like, oh yeah, there's that guy, you know? Um, so it was learning a different kind of communication and, and often a scripted communication where, um, again, I didn't ever say things that um, are given a script that I didn't believe or things that were against my philosophy or I would have left the job, but saying only some things and not saying other things were part of a regime that I, you know, learned about communicating because there was a whole cabinet doing the same thing. They wanted people on the same message. So that was, so there were evolutions of communication along the way. Let's jump to a cosmic view of a, a phrase you just used a while ago, the American healthcare system. I cringe when I hear politicians say we have the best healthcare system in the world. Uh, as you said in your earlier talk to the students, uh, we certainly have the best care available to some people some of the time, but we do not even have a system, a true national system of any kind. People fall through the cracks all the time. And one of the things that worries me about the continuing uh, saga of the Affordable Care Act is that it basically still depends on the preservation of the private health insurance industry, which to me still as a problematic construct in terms of a system. Talk about that. Well, I don't disagree. Um, and again, it's a kind of uniquely American structure where I think the president made a, a calculated political judgment that um, 180 plus million people had private health insurance uh, based on typically an employer relationship or insurance they could buy. And that to go to a single payer plan or a government run system was too far a leap. And if you look at the furor caused by just trying to fill the gap, I think he was right about that calculus. That would have probably been impossible. Having said that, we still are paying a huge price for that additional layer of cost and that additional layer of control that most people in the world both don't pay, and I think we get more erratic uh, coverage because of it. Um, some of those issues have been smoothed out by the patient protection, so no longer having, I mean, insurance companies, um, and this comes from my bias as a former insurance regulator, 
um, you know, the way you made money in health insurance is sell to people who promise never to get sick. And if they get sick, throw them out. Um, it's pretty simple and it was very successful. Um, cherry picking the market worked well, designing plans that, you know, drove people out or priced people out or locked people out was pretty good. So getting rid of that is a step. Uh, I do think that if you can close the coverage gap, then the biggest drop in the uninsured population occurred last year, 25% lower now than it was at the beginning of open enrollment, and that's good news. If we can get a payment system under everybody, then I think you have a way to really grind down those overhead costs. Medicare runs at an overhead cost of 2 to 3%. Private health insurers are anywhere from 12 to 30 percent, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of a lot of give in that in that puzzle still. And um, even with the 80-20 rule that says they could charge up mm -hmm. to 20 percent overhead costs, I think that's way too high. Medicare, uh, as you said earlier, also uh, sets the stage and the tone and the specifics very often for the private insurance industry. You painted a very optimistic picture in your comments downstairs about the changes that are being wrought by Medicare that will spread throughout the entire system. You really think that's going to happen? Well, I sure hope so, because if it doesn't, we won't have Medicare in five or ten years. I mean, it just will not be financially sustainable. The program will be blown up. So you have, I think, two choices. One is a program that has been, or a proposal that's been put forward that says you basically guarantee a contribution an amount of money. You let Americans basically shop for their benefits with that amount of money. You, you know, risk adjust a little bit. You give a little bit more money to people who are low income or people who um, are chronically ill, but you have a guaranteed um, contribution system. Medicare right now is a guaranteed benefit system. You have certain benefits when you get Medicare eligible. and. Um, but that relies on, the guaranteed benefit system relies on then changing the cost trajectory. It is right now, um, four and a half years after the Affordable Care Act was passed and signed into law, we are at the lowest growth ever in the history of the Medicare program, ever. We've never seen costs uh, rising at such a low level and they're really trending with GDP. And if that can happen, Medicare can survive, and I think um, it is a far different program as a guaranteed benefit system, mm -hmm. which is, I think, very helpful and support because you can't risk adjust everything. You don't know when you're going to get sick. You can't promise. You know, you won't have a stroke tomorrow. And as you say, I'm an optimist, though. I'm a, you know, pro-choice Catholic. I'm a Democrat from Kansas, and I root for the Kansas City Royals. 29 years, who knew? You know, we're back. As we all, I think, are doing, by the way. <laughs> you bet, you bet. So optimism is part of my DNA. I have to tell you one little story that illustrates the problem in so many ways. Uh, when Bill Frist was still Senate Majority Leader and I was still working at ABC News, I was invited to uh, an evening dinner in his private dining room with two other guests, Hillary Clinton and Newt Gingrich. And they were there to assure me that within six months, via Medicare, there would be a national standard for IT allowing total interchangeability mm -hmm. of uh, medical data. This was 12 years ago. It still hasn't happened. Isn't that an example of how hard it is to control the private enterprise system in healthcare, even with a monolithic uh, powerhouse like Medicare? Well, I remember, you know, that, that era when actually there was a lot of activity with Newt and Hillary around IT. Right. Um, I would say we're a whole lot closer than we were, and in fact, there's lots of demand now by providers for interoperability that wasn't there before. And to me, um, you know, interoperability is a team sport. Uh, it's fine to have Tom Brady or Eli Manning, but if you don't have a receiver downfield, it really doesn't matter who your quarterback is because you're still not able to throw a pass that anybody can catch and anybody can score. That's sort of where we are right now where there are lots of systems beginning to exchange, but I got to tell you the cry for providers, uh, first of all, there's been a great adoption of electronic records. No question about that. Over the last four years. Uh, standards have been set nationally. That never existed before. And providers are right now saying we have to get to this next step. 
They didn't even know this terminology four years ago. That was not a conversation in healthcare. So I think we are um, at the tipping point where it can't come from the outside imposed on the medical system, but I think now the providers are saying this is something that we have to have in order to practice good medicine into the future, and I think it will happen. Uh, my 25 minutes are up. It's now your time, and I'm encouraging you to ask any and all kinds of questions. You may want to ask more questions about uh, Madam Secretary's personal experience and growth and leadership, uh, but feel free to ask whatever is on your mind. If it's inappropriate, I'll tell you so. <laughs> yes, and uh, we ask you to give your name and your status. Uh, my name is Luke Allen. I'm a Master's in Public Health, Global Health student here. What would you like to be remembered for? What a great question. Well, I'd, I'd say the, um, the legacy of the Affordable Care Act is uh, a wonderful legacy to have. But I guess in a, in a more global sense, just having made a difference, having made a positive difference in people's lives and working hard to do that. So maybe not one particular thing, but just, you know, that's what I've been trying to do most of my life. And I'll, I'll just add the observation that while the Affordable Care Act was a terrible experience for you at the time of the rollout, I do believe it will turn out to be a positive legacy. That's right. my personal right. opinion. Another question. Uh, let's go here. My name is Sonny Patel, and I'm a fourth year med student at Mayo Clinic, and I'm doing an MPH in global health here as well. Um, my question is, um, in 2017, a lot of states can um, have innovative programs under the Affordable Care Act. What are your thoughts on Vermont's sort of single-payer-esque um, move? Well, I think that um, Governor Shumlin in Vermont is very <laughs> determined that that will be one of the models tested, but actually they're there are now six states that are doing all-payer experiments. Um, Arkansas is one of them, uh, Maine is another. Um, looking at ways that you really can um, have a, a different kind of healthcare delivery if everybody was at the table, if you put in private employers and the state and the federal government and shared data and shared information. So states have always been laboratories of innovation. I think it's, um, they've always been well ahead of the federal government. What's exciting is I think some of the national programs are finally catching up. So I'm really eager to figure out what folks learn. Um, the whole dual eligible population, which is the most costly population, at least in public health programs, uh, we finally have uh, authority for states to actually try to manage that population in a very transparent way that wasn't available when I was a governor. I would have loved to have been able to do that. So there's a lot going on on the state space, um, and the single payer in Vermont is just one of them. But exciting innovation, exciting ways to look at their high cost, high risk patients, ways that they can deliver care differently, ways that they can open up the scope of practice. Um, that I think will really inform better health care in the future. In the back, and then we'll come back down here. Hi, my name is Dominic Crusoe. I'm a student in the one-year MPH program. I'm just wondering when, uh, regarding Medicaid expansion, when you received Arkansas's application to use Medicaid funds for premium support for buy buying insurance on the private market, how did you approach their application and how difficult was it to make that decision? And, and just give a little context sure. for our viewing audience also. Um, well, as the when the Supreme Court decision came down, the while well, they upheld the vast majority of the law, they struck down the provision that said basically that HHS could use um, levers and withhold Medicaid funds from states who chose not to. <coughs> How about that technique? Remember, <coughs> H1N1. <laughs> learn to sneeze, um, <laughs> states who did not expand Medicaid. So they made it a voluntary provision. And, but they went further than that, and that's really what Arkansas is about. They basically, the court decision says there's the traditional Medicaid program, which was written into law in 1965, and then the new Medicaid. And they made the newly insured population a kind of different entity. And um, Arkansas, um, Mike Beebe, who is the governor of Arkansas, wanted very much to expand Medicaid. And we'd had numbers of meetings and numbers of conversations before he came in with the exact proposal. 
And um, he basically said, I need something that we can say is not traditional Medicaid. And we said, well, that's fine, because actually the court gives you that permission. We outlined for him very clearly. Mike is the former attorney general. He understands the law very well. He's very savvy. He had a Republican legislature, and not just a Republican legislature. He had a provision in Arkansas that said three-fourths of the legislature has to vote for Medicaid expansion. So he was facing this really high hurdle. Um, but we, we worked on it, and what we realized is that um, if he could figure out this strategy, it also could open the door for others who wanted, wanted to do the health expansion but didn't necessarily want to say they were collaborating with the president or expanding Medicaid. So there was a lot of a lot of back and forth. And um, when he finally submitted the application, we knew it was an application we could accept. And the language was um, available. A couple of lines in the sand. Lots of states wanted to expand only to 100% of poverty and put everybody else into uh, the exchange. That became a, a barrier to expansion said you have to go to 133%. That's the way the law was written. That's what was designed. So lots of conversations around that. And how much um, could you impose on people below the poverty level in terms of charging them any copays or penalizing lack of support? Again, that, that was a principle that Medicaid had always had a limitation on under poverty. Above, in the 100 to 133 percent, there was a lot of flexibility for governors. And that's really what we kind of designed. I think you're, you're going to see, hopefully, very soon Utah about to come in the door under that same, you know, Pennsylvania has a variation of it. But what, what we knew is that if we could design a plan for Arkansas, it would really be a mod. It was principles of that plan that could be used by lots of other states, and that's what's happened. Good question here. We have a microphone right behind you. Hi, my name's Rosa. I'm on the MPH policy program here at the school. Um, so something that our dean often refers to is a public health momentum that we're currently living in with the ACA, with Medicaid expansion, transfat ban, et cetera. I was wondering, um, based on your experiences um, as a public health leader, what kind of advice could you give to us as future public health leaders to keep up this momentum in the face of adversity? Well, it's a great question. Um, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm encouraged that there's so many bright, talented um, folks who want to go into public health. That's, that's a great place to start this conversation. And I do think there is an awareness of, um, uh, by lots of ordinary people, that staying healthy in the first place is good for them and their families. It's, you know, longer, happier lives, you know, better futures. So I think you see a very different attitude than certainly when I was growing up uh, about smoking, about seatbelt use, about um, you're beginning to get people to pay attention to nutrition and diets. Um, salt is still a big issue, but I, I mean, I think that's coming. Um, so there are conversations going on now that certainly weren't going on 10 or 15 years ago. I, um, I was struck as we went through the health reform. Um, you know, the American Medical Association, by the way, always opposed health reform up until um, 2010. That's the first time the AMA ever, nurses always supported it, but the AMA always opposed health reform. It was going to be socialized medicine. It was going to, you know, the world was going to end. But my favorite ad, my very favorite ad, which I uh, went back and saw, was around Medicare. They opposed Medicare also, by the way. Um, was an ad that the AMA put out uh, that had a doctor. It was a print ad. Um, I think it was in Life magazine, which doesn't even exist anymore. Um, a doctor sitting on his patient's bedside giving um, advice about the healthcare system going to hell in a handbasket, smoking a cigarette. <laughs> really, this was the print ad. So it's we're in a different era. I think people uh, kind of get the fact that that doesn't make a lot of sense. And I would say that um, relating, again, public health makes, you know, that terminology kind of makes people's eyes glaze over. They don't know what you're talking about. They don't really care what you're talking about. 
but relating it to them. I mean, how these five steps for a pregnant woman make a difference in your baby at the time that he or she is born and make a difference for life. People kind of get that. Um, you know, your child eating more fruits and vegetables when he or she goes to school as opposed to ketchup as a vegetable makes a difference. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. having gym class three times a week actually makes them able to sit down and learn math. Uh, and so kind of connecting it to people's lives and why it makes a difference to them, I think, um, is a way to sort of push through so you're not in a lecture circuit, it's really more how this affects me and my family and why, why I should care about it and why it should be a priority. And I think that conversation is beginning to take hold and um, can be really important. You all have a great opportunity to push that forward. I know she left out Mayor Bloomberg's passion for soda size in I your do. litany there. The big gulp, I, you know, it's, <laughs> it's an important. Um, Down here. Hi, I'm Katherine Heflin, again, <laughs> master's student here um, in health policy management. And um, yes, and I actually wanted to speak to you about Kansas. Um, I was very appreciative of your leadership there as governor, and you were recognized by Forbes for your leadership there. You were Times top governors of all time, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that and give us some leadership advice from your time as governor back to when you were your own boss, and if there were things that you were especially proud of while you were governor of Kansas. Um, well, getting elected was um, a big deal uh, and reelected. But I, I'd say, um, you know, being the governor, I think, is the best political job in America. If any of you are thinking about politics, that's the job you want. Because you don't have all of the international, really, uh, you know, you're a CEO of a state and you can really kind of move the needle and watch things happen. and. And states, unlike Washington, with Washington, punting is a sort of way of life. For the five years, and Howard knows this as well as anyone, we didn't have a budget at HHS. Did not have a budget. Now, this is the largest domestic agency in the United States government, 90,000 people, 11 agencies. Um, Congress just didn't want to pass a budget, so they didn't. And so you didn't literally know, and the government was shut down three times during that period of time. Um, sometimes for short periods of time, sometimes for a long period. But I mean, think of what that does to people who are supposed to come to work every day. They really don't know if they're going to get a paycheck. They don't. You don't know if you're going to be able to hire new people or lay them off. Um, you have these crazy rules. So states actually run. Um, they have to get things done. They they move things ahead. And you know, as governor. Um, Catherine knows this, but I inherited a long time school finance battle that had been unresolved and was working its way through the courts. I mean, unresolved for eight years. And we finally, I always had a Republican legislature the whole time I was there, so this wasn't with Democrats working with me, but we resolved that and got the court to declare the new law constitutional. It took three or four tries, but that was a huge, a huge deal going forward. Um, we had a lot of success in, in terms of job creation and created an entity that um, my successor has sort of dismantled, but a bioscience authority that basically looked at the assets we had and had a way to divert um, new taxes from jobs created in the bioscience sector into investments. So we ended up with startup companies and various kinds of investments in Kansas. So there was a lot going on that um, was actually very positive, I think, uh, for the state. Two weeks from now, I'm hoping it can return a little to sanity because um, Kansas has been uh, now experimenting with a, um, not my words, but other people's words, the most radical tax plan in the country where the current governor has slashed uh, income tax levels for um, all corporations for high-end individuals. Uh, the state's going to have about a $200 million shortfall this year, but about a trillion dollar shortfall going forward. Um, schools have had the biggest cuts they've ever experienced in the state. Uh, three financial downgrades have occurred in the last two years in Kansas by the financial markets. 
So it's been a very big swing, and um, I think the voters are going to have to decide, you know, what's what's the model that they want going forward because it's a it's a real different. And what look. are the polls showing currently? Um, currently, the Democratic candidate continues to be three to five points ahead. Um, so we'll see. Now we'll all look with <laughs> great interest at the results. Other questions? We'll see. Yes, in the back. Hi, my name is uh, Doug Jacobs. I'm in between my third and fourth year medical school, and also uh, here for also here for the MPH, and actually an intern at HHS as well. Um, and so, uh, my question is: Now that you've been governor, and now that you've been the secretary of HHS, what's in your future, and how do you feel like you can continue to impact the world? You know, I I don't know exactly what is in my future. I'm in the process of um, having lots of conversations about that right now. Um, I am a grandmother. I have a two-year-old, nearly perfect grandson, so um, <laughs> that is definitely in my future. And having a little bit more flexible time to hang out with George is um, something that has been a lot of fun. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at doing some continued global health work, uh, which I found interesting and compelling and really important. Um, I am doing some speaking. I probably will do a little bit of teaching. I, um, I'm having conversations with private sector companies that are looking at um, the financial side of you know, how you start up companies with disruptive technology potentially in this delivery system area. I, that's an, I've been in the public sector for 30 years, so it's really fascinating to talk to people about what actually is going on in the private sector and how that needle can be moved maybe. Um, so I don't know exactly all the pieces of the puzzle, but so far it's been really interesting to explore. And I am doing some speaking uh, around the country, and that's kind of nice because I can pick and choose, saying I will do that and not do that, and um, trying to catch up on um, sleeping and <laughs> reading and Wonderful. seeing friends. Yes. Hi, my name is Ariel. I'm a Master of Science student in Global Health and Population. Right. I was wondering what were some of the skills and knowledge bases that you found most useful and how did that change throughout the roles you held? And tell us a little about uh, your educational background in terms of coming to your first elected position with certain skills. Well, I um, majored in political science with a minor in history in my undergraduate years and had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do when I got out of school and, and didn't have any plan. I was telling students downstairs that the notion somehow that you have to have a master plan and that you've failed life if you don't know where you're going to be in five years and in ten years. Um, I'm here to tell you that uh, I hadn't a clue. Um, you know, my resume makes sense looking from where I am now backwards. It looks like I, I had this nice plotted plan. Not true at all. Um, I went to Kansas because I married a Kansan. I'd been there twice in my life, um, so this wasn't a well thought out strategy either. Uh, and actually, I worked for a lawyer's association. Um, when I worked in corrections first for a number of years. Um, and then I, I worked for a lawyer's association. And the reason I ran for the legislature in the first place was because I wanted to go home. I was working about 60 hours a week. I had a two-year-old and a five-year-old. And my lifestyle and my children and my husband was a busy trial attorney didn't, wasn't working very well. And the legislative seat in our district opened up. And in Kansas, the legislature is a part-time job. So people have said to me, oh, well, you ran for the legislature to be governor. I said, no, I really ran to go home. I had a, it was a part-time job that I could do much more easily with my kids. I mean, I loved the politics. I'd grown up in politics. I was a volunteer. I did a bunch of stuff. But I didn't really have this plot. Um, I think risk-taking is a big, important part of going forward. And I don't mean standing at the top of the Washington Monument, jumping off, risk taking. <laughs> That's just stupidity. Um, I mean knowing that you may not know 100% of what you're getting into, that you have some confidence that, first, it's really interesting to you and you're willing to learn it. And secondly, that you can 
you know, take a deep breath and, and go for it. Um, you will never get a job unless you apply for it. You will never have an opportunity unless you try to take it. Um, so I, I do believe being willing to take a risk, which means that you could lose, right? Um, you know, you can't run for office unless you're willing to lose. You have to have a plan to win, but you have to also be willing to lose because that does happen. Um, so I think, I think being willing to take risks, knowing that life is a continuous learning experience and that you, I'd, I'd say the best kind of advice is find the best mentors you possibly can. Find something you like and want to do not for the rest of your life, even short term, and then figure out who does it best that you know and, and go ask them to help you learn about it. You know, people are delighted to tell you what they love and, and how they do it. Um, so there's always something that somebody does better. I think as an employer, I learned quickly, bringing the best possible people around me, you know, who, was, who had all the skills that I didn't have, who was really smart at doing things and being willing to listen to them and, and take advice from them. HHS, one of the best things about it, and I mean, there are hugely amazing things about that five years, five and a half years. But I worked with the smartest, most dedicated, most incredible people I will ever work with in my life. People who were well below their market value, who just came to do the mission and came because they believed in health and human services and they were there every day doing incredible things. People like Howard Coe who just said, you know, put me in, I'm ready, I'm here um, and came from all over the country, all over, you know, the globe and that was just, that was amazing. So surrounding yourself with good people, good mentors and then learning what you don't know I think is, is always a, a great thing. Great advice. Some more questions. Yes, we'll take Young lady, and then behind. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Vitsum. I'm a master's student in social and behavioral sciences here. Um, I wanted to ask about your 2011 decision around minors' access to emergency contraception, and what were the factors at play in your making that decision? Well, it's a it's a great question. Um, this was a. Um, an FDA approval process that um, I had been briefed about as it went along. It was a... Um, Maybe just back up again with a bit of context for others who might be watching and didn't catch the question. Well, there was a, a, a drug that um, was not approved, well, it had a long and torturous history uh, in the United States, uh, had been approved in Europe for a long time um, that was uh, approved during the Bush administration um, for uh, over 17 year olds uh, over the counter, under 17 year olds with prescription only. And it was um, the decision at that time was based on um, a lack of evidence is, is what the scientists said at the time, that um, they didn't have the evidentiary background to have the clinical trials available for the younger group to be um, appropriately using it over the counter. A, an application came in from the company saying we want to take the age limit off and put it over the counter for everybody. Um, and submitted with that application was clinical trials that only went down to age 16. Uh, and then uh, an interpolation that said, uh, but we think it's appropriate for anybody 12, I mean, menstruation basically starts in some girls as early as 10 and 11, 12 is about the average age. There was no clinical data for 12 year olds, for 13 year olds, for 14 year olds. And in over the counter, one of the issues is, do you have the comprehension to adequately read and understand the instructions? Can you use it appropriately? Um, which, which makes a distinction between over-the-counter and with a prescription. Um, the FDA, who had, I think, been frustrated at earlier uh, problems with it um, and felt that the ruling had been overly political, came forward and I talked to Dr. Hamburg, the head of the FDA at the time, and said, I'm really troubled. I, I need to get more background and briefing. But um, I understand that um, 
you know, there's an issue within your drug approval folks, but we still are missing this clinical data. If, if why didn't the company either submit the application along with the age group that they had the data for, or do the clinical trials on a younger group? Well, they couldn't recruit the younger group. I said, well, that's really, again, a problem because this is going to be a politically controversial issue. I know that. But if you don't have the, then the scientific backup to say, well, we know it can be used. It's been demonstrated. We've taken a look at it. Um, we're in this real catch-22. I also felt it was very important that the FDA process be pristine and that it not be, if a uh, decision was made to turn down the application, that it be me that make it not that I tell Peggy Hamburg to make it, which is what had happened in the Bush administration. There had been a directive, a secretarial directive, that the head of the FDA intervene in the drug approval process. Um, so I made the decision. I knew it would not be very popular. And basically, we also communicated to the company that uh, either submit additional clinical data or um, you know, amend the application. We did not have the authority. People said, well, why didn't you just approve it for over-the-counter for the age group that you had? That is not, that wasn't an option. Once a company comes in with an application, it's yes or no. You don't have the authority to amend the application along the way. That would have been the easiest thing to say, okay, 15 and up, absolutely, it should be over the counter. Anybody else come in with new clinical data, but that wasn't an option. So it was, it was not an uncomplicated um, decision, um, and I know it riled a lot of people in the, in the public health community. Um, they did subsequently, very quickly, the company came back and submitted the application, amended the application for the age group that they had the data for, and it was very quickly approved and went through, but that was really the issue. Okay, uh, I'm getting the high sign that we're coming down to the last five minutes, and the plan is, Madam Secretary, for you to summarize in three minutes all the leadership <laughs> skills that you have learned in your entire life, and then we'll close it off. Well, I don't think I'll try to do that. Um, you do whatever you want. But I, well, I want to take just a couple of minutes to um, tell all of you that I really do think you are um, at an historical time and entering the health field at an amazing opportunity where there is, um, I think transformation is an overused word, but to use it in the context of what's going on in healthcare right now is not at all an exaggeration. There is a lot going on, delivery system reform, uh, overall health reform, a lot of public health conversations that just were not even possible a number of years ago, global collaboration in a way, and I think the upside of some of this Ebola outbreak will be an understanding of how connected we are in a global world, that we really can't sit back in the United States or in an industrialized country and say it really doesn't matter what happens over there because what happens over there is going to be ours in a moment. And that was a difficult concept even to talk about you know five and six years ago uh, so you are really at a at a edge of a a new beginning a new chapter it's a very exciting place to be uh, we need competent globally minded health in all policy folks emerging uh, because really we will not be a prosperous successful country unless uh, we are a healthier country, and we won't be a healthier country unless we help to make a healthier world. So I just want to congratulate you for choosing this, first of all, but also to tell you that um, we need great leaders, and you're going to be well positioned to do very exciting things in the future, and I'm just delighted to be here. I am also supposed to remind everybody that the next forum is November 4th with Paul Farmer from Partners in Health. And I want to close this session by saying that uh, while there have been some questions and controversies surrounding some of your policies, I have never heard anybody question your personal integrity or your desire to help those in need. And we're, we're honored to have you here today. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks so much.